All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Scott Weevil, who's just up the state a little bit up in Lake Tahoe. How are you doing, Scott? I'm doing excellent. Thanks for having me so much, John. Yeah, and Scott is the founder of Sierra Pacific Partners, a lower middle market investment bank focused on sell side mergers and acquisitions, advisory services. They function like a real estate agent, but in the complex world of selling businesses rather than selling uh, buildings. Uh, as you said, you're up in Lake Tahoe. And what we're going to talk today about is how to sell, um, uh, selling your lower um, uh, middle market business. So, so Scott, um, you know, obviously, um, you know, when you come around to sell a business of any size, there's a, there's a, you know, there's many things that you have to take into consideration, but, uh, what would you advise to people when, especially if you have a, a lower middle market business and you're considering selling, what are some of the first things you should do? For sure. I think, you know, I, the further out you can start to prepare, the better, um, which is always the case. A lot of times when folks come to me, I don't really assist so much with the preparation as with the actual transaction. And there's a whole industry of exit planners who do assist with actually preparing your business to sale before the transaction gets turned over to someone like me. But I think, you know, I, I talk to sellers every day and I can tell you some of the most important things that buyers are looking for are clean financials. Mm. You know, if you can get your financials, um, as close to what we call gap generally accepted accounting principles as possible that that looks good um you know this is cl clearly this is a sales podcast so growing yeah. sales which leads to growing earnings um is definitely for the most part there are exceptions to that but for the most part is something that buyers are looking for and i think the third thing that is is huge is a lack of dependency on the seller so in other words, again, your sales podcast, I'm going to focus on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. If the seller has all the key customer relationships, that's very, very scary to a buyer because they're right. going to say, wait a minute, when, when she goes away, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. And the third, you know, I had another thing is that essentially, I think what one of the things buyers really look for is customer concentration issues. If your revenue stream is dependent upon just a few customers, that's scary. Essentially, you're trying to show factors to the buyer that the earning stream will continue in the right. future and anything that's a risk to that you're trying to mitigate because that's what they're essentially buying is that earning stream. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's a really good point as well is to make sure that uh, that what you're selling is not you and a bunch, as you said, a bunch of customer relationships, but you're selling an actual business that they can take over, they can integrate, they can scale, whatever. But as you said, that's not 100% reliant upon you. Um, and then when they when they come to somebody like you, I mean, uh, when you start when you start working uh, with helping a business to sell, um, you mentioned a couple of things that buyers are looking for, obviously clean financials and all of that. But what, what, what's, what's attractive in, in a market like today? I think generally speaking, you know, there's always private equity funds who are a huge buyer, um, mm -hmm. even in the lower middle market space now, which is fantastic because historically, these a lot of the businesses in this space were sort of in a no man's land where they were too small for large corporate right. strategic acquisitions but they were also too big for individual purchasers. And so, you know, a $50 million business that may not be interested, interesting to, you know, a Fortune 500 company, but that's a big check for most individuals to write. Mm -hmm. So it's great to see their involvement in the space, but I think they tend to chase varied industries. So, I mean, the last couple of years, HVAC is hot, you know, whatever. If you're in healthcare, maybe pediatrics roll-ups have been hot. I think it's very, very hard to anticipate those industries and, and, and mm -hmm. build a plan that way. But there are certain... Um, hallmarks that acquirers are looking for like for instance anything with a recurring revenue model that's why mm -hmm. that buyers love SaaS, right yeah. because that de-risks that customer revenue coming in particularly if it's contracted right so anytime you can build those sort of features into your business that'll be something that's desirable 
Yeah, no, and absolutely, and and obviously, you know, the 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 technology stack and all of that is is important as well. Um, but uh, explain a little bit because I think to some people, like they think uh, when they think about selling a business, they think, okay, you find a buyer, you agree a price, and you sell, and that's that's kind of. But there are different ways that that actual deal can be constructed, right? And I think sometimes, you know, especially if you got PEs and that coming in, sometimes it's you know they may not buy you outright they may take a majority stake or whatever so explain maybe the different types of of uh, constructs of deals absolutely and generally speaking we're talking about m a which means mergers yeah. and acquisitions but that's just a fancy way of saying selling a business and yeah. usually in the private context we are not actually talking about mergers like you see on wall street mm -hmm. and the short answer to your deal is there are almost as many different structures as we call them as there are deals themselves but what you from a legal perspective i think the two main structures are you do an equity transaction where they buy your company stock or you do what we call that a stock deal or we do an asset deal where they buy all your company's assets. And to be clear, that's different from an asset sale, which sort of implies a liquidation. The assets they're buying in an asset deal include your goodwill, your reputation, and things like that. There's tax consequences to that stuff, which is a little bit beyond what, what we're talking sure. about here. But for sure, one of the big mistakes we see sellers make is they focus too much on the top line purchase price and not enough on the terms that surround mm -hmm. that purchase price. And deals can be heavily structured. So to your point, you know, in a lot of mostly control transactions, change of control transactions where they're buying either the whole company or most of the company, one thing that buyers will typically do is they'll try to give you rollover equity, yep. which means that you're taking, you can almost think about it as retaining an equity position in the company, although typically it'll be in a new vehicle. And that's generally done if the seller is going to continue in management post-closing to incentivize that seller to still work on behalf of the company. Right. Um, for top tier acquirers, top tier funds, it tends to be viewed as something very, very lucrative because they have a great reputation of turning $1 into three post exit. And so sellers actually clamor for that. The, a, a good sign if it's a top tier fund is if they actively don't care whether you take the rollover or not, right. because it should be very expensive for them to give that to you. And so if you decline it, they should say, okay, that's totally fine. <laughs> um, on the other end, taking rollover with an unknown operator is very, very, you know, it's a very risky proposition mm -hmm. because you don't know that they do not have a track record of performance, maybe don't have a track record in the industry, and you don't know what they're going to do with your business. Um, sort of on a similar note is an earnout, which just means if you hit certain milestones post-closing, you get paid more. Um, those milestones can be earnings based. They can, you know, in life sciences, yeah. they're often based on FDA approval. So they don't always have to be, you know, like I said, earnings based, revenue mm -hmm. based or anything like that. But again, typically the issue there is the seller is no longer in control of the company post closing. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that's maybe a little bit more palatable if the seller stays on as CEO but maybe a little bit less so. I mean, and, and I typically tell cl uh, my clients yeah. on the sell side to make sure they are happy with the cash at closing. And if they walked away and they never got anything out of the rollover or the earnout, that would be acceptable. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that, that's good advice. Because obviously, I mean, if you do the, the rollover, if you are uh, maintained, I mean, you're held to the forecasts and the projections and everything that you made. So I guess during the process, uh, you need to go into to make sure you're as transparent as possible while you're bullish about the opportunity. You also don't want to oversell it, particularly if you're going to be held to that. That's 100 percent. If you're pushing for evaluation based on uh, very optimistic, we'll call them projections, mm -hmm. expect to be held to that on the end. They're going to flip the table and said, hey, two months ago, we were in a conference room and you told us 100 percent you can meet these numbers. Why are you worried now? Mm -hmm. and, and I would say particularly about earnouts, I think that earnouts are OK if they are priced based on future growth. However, you shouldn't really have an earnout based on the business's current performance mm -hmm. unless it's just. Unless it is based on that current performance, because otherwise you're not getting paid for the business that you have as of today. Yeah. And then talk to me a little bit about how you prepare the seller, because let's face it, when you get it, when you, I mean, most people with their business, it's their it's their baby. They've built it up. You know, they've 
poured their you know blood, sweat, and tears into it. And now you're going to have people, and it's obviously it's a transaction. You're going to have people on the other side who are going to call your baby ugly and try to <laughs> you know push it down a little bit. How do you prepare people for that? Because I feel like that can sometimes be a very emotional uh, experience for sellers. For sure, um, it is. And I was actually going to use the same metaphor talking about the, the <laughs> ugly baby. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think one of the things to realize as a seller is that they're not necessarily calling the baby ugly. They just want to have a firm understanding of the business, not only to know what they should pay for it, but also what they may need to be concerned about or may need to work on a little bit on the back end. But I do think it's a process. I mean, you know, I've seen gone through deals and some of the first things I tell my owners are, you know, how are you going to feel if they give up that lease for that building that you like? You know, Tori is your favorite employee. She has been there 25 years. What if she gets fired in the second week after closing? Mm -hmm. You have to be prepared for all those things because the simple sort of metaphor I use, you buy the house, you choose what color to paint the walls. Yeah. And that's sort of how you should look at a, at a buyer post-closing. But it is hard. And I think one of the things we try to do as intermediaries is temper the discussion between the buyer and the seller. And typically the buyers want that too. They want to be able to ask their hard questions because they need they need to ask them, they need to get answers to them. But at the same time, they want the continuing support of that seller. Most buyers are not looking to um, grossly offend the seller mm -hmm. and then close the transaction with a person that may not be too willing to help them out post-closing if issues arise. Yeah. So what are some other things that um, when when they when a, a seller gets into a process with you, what are some other considerations or things that they should they should look to work on or prepare? Yeah, I think, again, it's a lot of it is financials driven. Mm -hmm. So the, one of the first things I'm going to do if I talk to a seller, we have a good fit. I'm going to send them an NDA saying I'm yeah. going to you know respect their information and then they'll send me their financials and we'll start to meet heads around evaluation. I think that's the first thing. I think one of the big mistakes that we see sellers make candidly is just valuations that have no root in reality. I mean, yeah, you hear at the country club, somebody sold for a thousand times revenue. Well, what you do, they didn't tell you is they made 10 bucks last year. So they yeah. sold for $10,000, right? And so I think that's one of the things that we work on. Um, we also definitely encourage our sellers to keep things confidential. Mm -hmm. I think you hear all kinds of horror stories, but I think most of the information I've heard is that confidentiality breaches can ultimately be traced back to the seller. I mean, I had a mm -hmm. seller who his son caught him at a gas station near, near the factory one day. And the dad, he knew the dad, there would be no reason for the dad to be over there. Um, other than something odd on the right. weekend. And so that's, and then the next Monday we're putting the sun under an NDA, but I think keeping, keeping things confidential is important. Um, we get lots of clients who first reach out to us after they've gotten offers to buy their company. Mm. And I would, obviously it's my job, um, to run m &A sales processes. So I would clearly encourage folks to reach out to us. But there's definitely something to be said about generating competition for the business. And even if you know that's a good buyer, just being able to say to that buyer, hey, we expect an offer from XYZ tomorrow. Where are you guys? It really helps spur the process alone, along. So I think those are some things that sellers should think about when they're going into a process. Yeah. And and then you mentioned valuation, and obviously that is the thing that gets most people exercised. Um, and you know they do all this research, and they see all oh, there's all these different ways of you know calculating you know uh, evaluation, and there's like revenue, there's um, you know profit and multiples, there's strategic. How, how do you how do you help with that conversation? Help understanding what are the elements that are going into your particular valuation. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's generally four, we'll call them mainstream ways to value a business. You know, this is an evaluation podcast, so I want sure. to get all into that. Yeah. But the one that your audience is most familiar with probably, and the one that's most heavily relied upon is the multiple method. Mm -hmm. And so basically, we're going to look at precedent transactions, basically meaning companies sort of like yours in your industry and what they sold for. And that gives us a multiple of the purchase price compared to something. Um, you hinted at that, that something is usually earnings or profit. Mm -hmm. We're going to call it EBITDA, earnings yeah. before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. 
Um, that's typically the multiple rather than revenue. There are some industries where revenue is standard. And there are some industries where it's a mix. For instance, in SaaS, if you are growing at 50% year over year, we can do revenue because the assumption is that you're sinking all your profits back into marketing to capture more company customers. However, if you're growing at 10% year to year, that unicorn SaaS company that you saw sell on a multiple of revenue, that doesn't apply to you. You're going to sell on a multiple of EBITDA. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the breakdown of EBITDA versus revenue is typically, I would say, generally speaking, unless you're in a strange industry, EBITDA is the default measure. Mm -hmm. And then now if you can prove some compelling case why revenue makes sense, then maybe that that applies to your company. Yeah, yeah. So um, do you find with most of your sellers that it's it's relatively easy to help them understand like the valuation range because i mean i think obviously it's like anything else i mean you go into it as you said you hear about these stories of like suddenly somebody got a strategic buy got like a, a multiple that was off the charts or whatever but so but when you're working with people um how do you keep them like focused on the range and and keep them kind of realistic in in, in their endeavors yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's one of the things that before we really go down the road with the seller because we're largely compensated based mm -hmm. on performance, meaning we get to an exit. And yeah. we're not going to get there if the seller and we have a, a very divergent opinion as to value and we think the market does as well. I think most sellers tend to understand. Um, mm -hmm. I would say there are sellers who aren't sure they want to sell now. And right. if they don't like the answer, they decide they just they definitely don't want to sell now. They want to wait until they can hit, you know, hit the mark um, for folks that are under some pressure to sell, whether that's that can be driven by almost anything. I think they quickly start to realize, you know, where we are as far as valuation. And you hinted at it, obviously. Strategic buyers can pay more um, for a variety of reasons. So that's, you know, a lot of times in. We talk about strategics this day and age. A lot of times we're talking about PE companies already own a larger company in the space mm -hmm. and they're buying, buying smaller ones. So a lot of times that's that's what we're speaking about. But generally, I try to tell my sellers that, look, if there is one company and you are the key to their growth and only one, first of all, they've probably already reached out to you. Mm -hmm. Second of all, though, they'll probably know that, too. So even if they're willing to pay 50 million and everybody else is only willing to pay 25, they're probably not just going to give up $25 million if they can avoid it. Right, right. No, that's a, that's a great point as well. And I, I guess you touched on you touched on something there that the why now, obviously, sometimes it's a compelling, you know, there's a compelling event, maybe you need to sell or whatever. But I think a lot of the times it's it's a it's a it's a strategic decision in your business and your life. So I guess the the why now is is very important to establish, right? No, absolutely. I think one of the things sellers want and buyers want to know, and I want to know, is why are you selling? Yeah. Obviously, for certain businesses, retirement is a very common reason. You know, retirement and no one yeah. in no later generations interested. We also represent quite a few smaller private equity funds. And so at some point they need to exit out and give returns to their investors. So you can expect them to hold, I don't know, three to seven years. It's a little longer these days, mm -hmm. but that's generally um, the case. <coughs> um, same thing for search funds. They, they tend to divest on the, those schedules too, but there's, there's lots of different reasons, but I think buyers do want to hear a compelling reason why you want out. And also so that they know, they have some soft assurance that you're not going to compete with them post-closing. There will be a non-compete for sure, but they would rather hear that you're going to ride off into the sunset or if you're an entrepreneur, you're candidly bored with the industry and want to try something new. Right. And then just finally, um, just explain to a, a potential uh, person selling a business why working with somebody like you is a good way to go because how complex this process can be because as you say they probably get people reaching out to them saying oh i'll buy your business and they think oh i could do this without a middleman but tell us why it's important because i know it's extremely important so just explain why it's important to find somebody like yourself right it's a complex process we see tons of deals we know what's normal we know what 
we should expect for your deal, um, which is can be what different than what's normal. But I think one of the things that we bring to the table is we're able to reach out to buyers on a confidential basis without revealing who you are, um, which is super important. And I think overall, though, it's just dr- having a quarterback to drive the deal forward while you focus on running the business. Um, drive the deal forward and help you with those negotiations. It's always interesting to me that I think the various m a industry groups do surveys on what you know what sellers find is the most important part of our role and upfront sellers think that guy finds a buyer that's that right. guy's role it's yeah. interesting that post closing they say that is the absolute least important part of our role mm-hmm. that negotiations and just in general driving that deal forward keeping the momentum going is the most important part of our role now obviously without finding the buyer you don't get to that yeah, yeah, yeah. so i'm not negating the importance of finding a buyer but there's a lot that goes into it beyond that yeah absolutely well this has been fantastic all of scott's information is going to be below this video but before we go please do tell people a little bit more about sierra pacific partners and who your ideal customer is yeah for sure I got, I got it. I founded Sierra Pacific Partners after being a Wall Street M and A lawyer, and ended up honestly running a deal for a client that could not find a banker that he trusted. Um, and I just enjoyed it so much, I decided I wanted to be more central to the deal, more central to the participants. So today, we basically help out lower middle market companies, probably somewhere in the range of let's call it ten to one hundred fifty million in revenue, mm-hmm. may, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. Probably looking at five to one hundred million in purchase price. Um, all throughout the country, I have an SEC FINRA license, so I can work on any type of transaction anywhere. And we're across industries. We do everything from, like, I've got a construction company with 11 million or so in EBITDA. We're trying to get ready to get a market right now. I've also sold SaaS companies. I sold a restaurant group earlier this year. So we're pretty industry agnostic. We, uh, it's just more fun for me to work in different spaces. But if you if you fit that bill, feel free to reach out to us. I'm more than happy to talk. I love talking to sellers. Yeah, and and I would encourage you to, you know, it's 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 probably going to be your biggest transaction of your life, or maybe you'll do it multiple times. Who knows? But um, I would absolutely recommend that you you go with expertise uh, like Scott because it is a it is a complex process. Um, so thanks again, Scott. Thank you for watching, listening. Yeah.